Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see y'all today. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you for choosing to worship with us. There's a lot of places that you could be, and the fact that you have uh, decided to be here is something that we appreciate and do not take for granted. Now, let me say, if you're a guest here with us today, thank you for being here, and I'm going to give you two opportunities. Uh, if you're interested and uh, have some questions about the church or just uh, some things you'd like to ask or whatever it might be, uh, we, there's a couple things you can do. You can either send me an email. Uh, John, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org, or uh, in the pew in front of you, there's a guest card. Uh, you can fill that card out, and then as you leave today, if you fill that card out, you'll see some baskets on, our, uh, on the desk out in the, in the foyer for uh, the offering. Just drop it in there, and so that'd be your offering today, but we appreciate you being here, so either the card or an email, however you feel comfortable, but we'd love to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Uh, a couple things I want to encourage you about and remind you of, uh, Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, VBS starts. It'll run 9 to 12 uh, through Friday, but here's, here's one of the reasons I'm mentioning that. Wednesday night, during what would normally be our uh, prayer meeting time, we will be having VBS family night here in the sanctuary. So if you're normally a Wednesday night attender, don't, don't skip out on us. You come and get to watch the kids. I'll be bringing a, a, a devotional uh, that evening as well, but we're really going to focus on Vacation Bible School on that night. And if you don't normally come on Wednesday night, this would be a great time to come and to just have fun and seeing the kids and what they're doing during the week. But y'all be praying for the, uh, those who are working in VBS as they get ready. Uh, a couple things you're going to notice. You'll notice that the, uh, the hymnals are back out today. So let me give you a little bit of logistical uh, stuff there. I know yeah, many folks are excited about that. Here's what's going to happen. The words are still going to be on the screen. However, before that hymn, before we sing, you'll notice on the screen the hymn number is going to be there. So you will know what to turn to. We'll have the bulletins back out in a few weeks. So after that, it, that part won't be as big a deal as it will be for these next two weeks. But pay attention uh, before, if you're still going to, if you're going to use the hymnals. Some of y'all read music. I can't read music. So, it, you know, I'm jealous of people that can. Most people in my family can read music. I just don't know the language. Uh, but if you're, if you're going to be uh, singing from the hymnals, just be sure you pay attention to the screen before we sing so you know what number that is. Okay. Uh, three things I want you to do for me this week. Y'all know what those are. Number one, pray for somebody. Someone you know who doesn't know Christ. Pray for them specifically by name to come to faith in Jesus. Number two, connect with someone. Maybe, and you know, I know with pandemic things are starting to wind down and some folks are back and some folks still haven't quite gotten in. Send them a, a Facebook message, phone call, text run by their house, throw stuff at their door, whatever you need to do. Uh, just let them know that they've been missed and that they are, that they, they are in love. And so just connect with somebody this week. And then number three, invite someone. Someone that, as we sit here today, is not involved in a local Bible-believing church. If they're already in a place that loves the Lord and loves his word, they're where they need to be. But someone you know who isn't involved in a church like that or isn't in a church anywhere, invite them to come uh, and to worship with you. And let me, let me encourage you to do this. If they've never been here before, it's always a little scary to walk into a building you've never been in. That's one of the reasons we have some of the new signage that's in the hallway. That's, not, that, that's for visitors. We all know where to go. But if you've never been in the building before, you don't know. So if someone's never been here, meet them at the door. So that they're not walking into this place saying, okay, where do I go now? Do I go left? Do I go right? Where are they going to be? Say, I'll meet you at the door. You come, you sit with me, and that way you can take any, any fears that they might have about coming to a new place. So invite someone to come to church with you. Well, guys, let me pray for us, and then uh, we will sing together. Father, we thank you for a good day. We thank you for our Sunday school hour. We thank you for our teachers and for your word that has been taught and applied. And I pray now, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit as we sing together, as we pray together, as we gather around your word. Lord, just empower us this morning to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come, thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Stand as we sing, please. Come the fount of every blessing to 
open my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise thine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to Well, good morning. good morning. Before I share with you, before I share with you the verse for this morning, um, I just wanted to give a uh, an update about the the bottle fundraiser. So today was the uh, the last day that we were trying to collect the bottles and make sure we get all those over to Life Choices of Memphis for this week. The return table, remember, is down the hallway on the left um, in front of the offices. Um, but if, if you have one ready, but you don't have it with you today, by all means, still, still bring it next week. That's fine. We'll make sure it gets there. But um, we're, we're going to try to collect those all and, uh, and get them over to Life Choices this week. But thank you, guys. We, we had, uh, I think they, they came, they happened to be in the area the other day, one of the ladies, and, uh, and she picked up like three boxes that we had sent over so far. So we had a, a great response. So thank you guys for that. Um, the first that I'm sharing with you this morning is Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 1, and I, uh, I heard this recently. I, I'm, I was well familiar with this verse, but the way that I read it <clears throat> in the past was a little bit different from, from I heard someone teaching it just recently, and I wanted to share it with you. Uh, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and every sin that clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So the idea of uh, progressing through the, the marathon of, of our life and our, our spiritual walk and growing and progressing. And um, the idea, and how I had read it before when it talks about <clears throat> let us lay aside every weight and sin which so closely clings. You know, when you run, um, you know, if you're, if you're running for a race, you know, you wear, you know, stuff that isn't going to slow you down, stuff that isn't going to catch wind, just being as aerodynamic as possible, right? So the idea of spiritually running the marathon is recognizing areas that are problematic, consistently problematic of sin in your life and targeting those to improve, targeting those, applying scripture and spending time in prayer and fasting, doing different things, um, having somebody hold you accountable, doing different things to, to target specific areas of sin that are challenging for you, and we all have those. But in the past, I had read it as, let us all lay aside every weight and sin which so clings cling so closely. I would kind of read that as one and the same. But what I heard recently from somebody teaching this passage, they were talking about every weight and sin. So sin is obvious. We just talked about that. But laying aside every weight, every weight. And I was thinking about that as, as I heard it. And, and how it was described was that there can be things in our lives that can be hindrances to us that are not morally wrong. We can be too busy with different things in our lives that there is nothing wrong with them in general, but they may keep us from spending the adequate time we need in God's Word. Maybe they hinder our relationship. Maybe they hinder our ability and time availability to serve. Is there something in our lives that is a weight that is holding us back from serving to the full potential that God wants us to serve or pursuing that relationship to the extent that God wants us to pursue Him? 
So I was just kind of thinking about that the other day. I was like, that's kind of a whole different. Of course, there's, there's areas of sin we should be aware of, but is there an area that's a hindrance to me or a hindrance to my walk that I can't prioritize my walk or serving as much as God would, would like me to? Man, thank you, Adam. I understand that Adam did a great job preaching last week and uh, heard about that. And Tim and Andrew filled in for me for a couple weeks there, and they did a great job. Thank you guys for that. And actually, I've been hit several times this morning, and people have said, can Andrew sing that again? Uh, so, yeah, we'll have him sing it again before the summer's up, okay? Let's stand as we sing in Christ alone this great hymn about the life of Christ. <coughs> As we come to pray together this morning, I just want to encourage you to pray for Vacation Bible School. Uh, my wife Miranda made up some scripture photo cards, and they're available by the Welcome Center. I'll try to remind you this before we leave today, uh, but as we're talking about prayer this morning, uh, there are some ways you can pray for us, and on the cards they have the name of a child, the first name of those who've pre-registered already, and we also have teachers' names on there, and you know, we believe in, in you supporting us by prayer for this week ahead. And so I want to encourage you to take one of those as you leave today. Also, uh, don't forget that we have Children's Church available, so all of our families here uh, will dismiss for Children's Church following our prayer time together, okay? Well, let's do just that. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful that our hope is found in Christ alone. It's not about us. It's not about how good we can try to be. It's all because of the perfect righteousness and sacrifice of your Son. I'm so grateful that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. We're so undeserving of your love and grace, even as we stand here before you today. Remind us of these truths again and again, 
of the gospel as we worship you. Father, I thank you for your goodness to us. You are a good God, a great God, and you display that every single moment of every day in our lives. And we're just here to declare your glory today. And I pray not only in this service, but I would pray throughout this next week through Vacation Bible School. Help us to declare your glory in the gospel to every boy and girl that will be here, to families, uh, even as teachers, Lord, we would be reminded of it again and again. I pray that you then empower Brother John by the Holy Spirit as he preaches your word. Help us to obey it. Help us to be ready to, um, to love what we hear. Not just to hear it, but to love your word and to apply it. Uh, we pray that you'd receive all the glory for everything that's said and done in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you so much, choir. I've been looking forward to that since I heard them practicing Wednesday night. I love that song. I love that, 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 that arrangement. Um, and the, the psalm that it's based on has escaped my memory, but it is based on, I can't remember which one. I'll find it if I think about it during the week, but it's just when you hear the word of God in song, it's just something, something special. So guys, thank you for that. Uh, have y'all ever noticed that people do weird things? Y'all ever do anything odd? Here's one I'm talking, thinking about specifically. You ever have a light bulb go out in a room? Or maybe the power goes out in your house, right? And what do you just do? This just happens, right? The power's out, and you walk into a room, and what's the first thing you do? You flip the switch, right? And you look around, and you're like, oh, power's out, right? Or the bulb's out, or whatever. Why do we do that? Well, a couple reasons we do that. One, it's just habit. Well, that's what you do. You walk in the room, you flip the switch. And if you're a dad, you then walk in the room later and turn the flip the switch down because everybody in the house always leaves every light on, right? That's part of part of what dads do. We turn off. We spend most of our time turning off lights. That's what happens. But it's just habit. Now, why do we do that? Why do, what happens when you flip a switch? You're trusting. You're just assuming that that light's going to come on. It's actually an act of faith, and that's why it throws us off when it doesn't happen. We don't obviously, sometimes we don't even know how to handle it. We just, we're, we're just so used to that thing working. We're just so used to that being a part of our life that we don't even think about it anymore. It just becomes a part of our daily routine. It's an act of faith. It's an act of trust. So what I want to ask you this morning is, do you and I live with that kind of faith in our walk with the Lord? Do we just assume that he's going to do what he says he's going to do do we just assume that he's going to live up to his own character is it is it such a part of our life that we don't even have to think about it in fact the question this morning I want to ask is simply this how's your faith how's your faith do you and I simply trust God so much and so make it it's such a part of our life that it's, it's just a constant it's a given it's understood that God is going to do something that he's up to something that he's doing it for our benefit he's doing it for his glory and it's always going to be in accordance with his nature is it do we live with that kind of faith we're going to meet two people this morning who have that kind of faith they just trust that God's going to do something, and he does. And so I want you to take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 18. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. We kind of catch you up with what's going on, as, as Bill said. And it's good to have Bill back uh, this week. He, we, uh, we missed him in the office, and uh, he's, been, he's been back, and uh, those guys did a great job filling in for him. But it's, it's good that he and Brenda were able to, to get away and celebrate their anniversary, but we're, it's good that you're back. And, uh, and so... Where it's, you know, it's just not the same without him. It's just not, you know, it's just, he brings such, um, Bill's just super energetic in the office, you know, and he, no, I'm, I'm, anyway. Uh, Bill walks around and just sets us all straight and then goes back to his office. That's what he does. So it's been a couple of weeks since we've been in here because Adam preached last week as well. So we're in a series. We're going through, if you're a guest with us today, we're going through uh, Matthew chapters 8 through 14. Uh, one of the things we will eventually do as a church is go through the entire gospel of Matthew. We're doing it seven chapters at a time. But we're in a section in these first two chapters of Matthew uh, in this series in, in chapters 8 and 9 where it's just miracle after miracle after miracle. There's a slight pause. We've just finished up the pause where we hear, see Matthew's call uh, to follow Jesus, and we see Jesus have a conversation where we get the new wine. You don't put new wine into old wine skins. All that has just happened, but now we transition back into miracle after miracle. So look what happens, and notice the two people that are focused on in verses 18 through 26. This is Matthew 9. I'm going to read the whole thing. It says, while he was saying these things to them, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come, lay your hands on her, and she will live. Well, Jesus got up and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. And a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind him and touched the, the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, If I only touch his garment, I'll get well. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, Daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. 
And at once the woman was made well. When Jesus came into the official's house and saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder, he said, leave, for the girl's not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him. But when the crowd had been sent out, he entered and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And this news spread throughout all the land. Two people in this, in this story. Really, the focus isn't so much on the miracles as it is on the faith of those that encounter Jesus. So let's meet this first person. Go back to verse 18. It says, while he was saying these things to them, well, what are the these things? Well, it's the, the you don't put new wine into old wineskins. The fact that he is bringing something that is, that is new, something that is different, something that has been, been uh, where he has overcome all the rules and regulations of the Old Testament. He's fulfilled the law. He's talking about those things. And somebody comes up. It says, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him. We know from the other Gospels this man's name was Jairus. And he's a synagogue official. So what what does that mean? We really don't have this position uh, in, in the New Testament church. But what he was responsible for was to make sure that the service happened correctly. Uh, He might not be the one sharing the word that day. He might not be the one doing the the sermon, but he's the one that's going to make sure that when they come together on Saturday for the synagogue service that everything is how it's supposed to be. So he's really one of the main leaders there uh, in the synagogue. So this is is an important person within Judaism in this area. It says that he bowed down before him. He's showing Jesus the, the respect that is due. And here's what he says. My daughter has just died. But then listen, listen to the faith. But come, lay your hand on her, and she will live. He just assumes. Why would he assume that? Well, he would have heard about all the things that we've been seeing in chapters 8 and 9. He would have heard about all the miracles. These things are happening all around, at this point, still the Sea of Galilee. That's kind of where the center of all this is, in Capernaum and then the other side. He maybe heard about the calming of the storm, the healing of the paralytic, maybe about Peter's mother-in-law. I mean, all these miracle upon miracle upon miracle, the word had spread. And so he starts to hear about Jesus, and he just knows and assumes. He comes to him and he says, my daughter has died. And I know if you'll just come and lay your hand on her, she'll live. That's interesting. The, the, as far as miracles in the Bible go, there's really three times where it's really concentrated, where we have a lot of miracles. One is the time of the Exodus. The other one is the time of Elijah and Elisha. And if you go to Elijah and Elisha's ministries, you see there's twice in those parts of the Old Testament where, where young people have died. And the Lord uses those prophets to bring them back to life. And so this guy is thinking along those lines. He understands that Jesus is is representing God. He understands the power that he's showing. And I love the response in verse 19. It's just very matter of fact. Because remember, Matthew is part of this group now. He's already responded. Jesus said, come follow me two paragraphs ago. So Matthew's going. Verse 19, Jesus got up and began to follow him. And so did his disciples. So now they're on the way. They're going to go to Jairus' house. But along the way, something else happens. And we meet another person who just simply trusts in the Lord. Look at verse 20. And a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years. Now pause there in in the middle of the verse and we'll we'll get back to it in a second. But we, we hear about this lady. She's having a tough time. For 12 years, she's, had it. she's been suffering with the hemorrhage. Now, you can imagine with the blood loss and all that, she would have all kinds of medical issues. She's been very weak, and for 12 years, she's been dealing with this. But it goes even further than that because Mark's gospel actually gives us some more detail. In Mark chapter 5, verses 25 and 26, Mark tells us this. He said, a woman who had an hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hand of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all. She must have Blue Cross Blue Shield. That's all I can figure. But rather had grown worse. I'm joking. I have Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's fine insurance. I was just going for the laugh. But anyway, it occurred to me this morning as I was reviewing. This lady had lost everything. She she had lost her fight. She she was destitute. Not only was she physically spent, 12 years she'd been dealing with this, but now her finances are wrecked, everything. And by the way, because she had this hemorrhage, because she had the flow of blood, as one translation puts it, she would have been perpetually unclean. So she would not have been able to worship. 
She would not have been able to go to synagogue. She would have been outcast in many ways. So she is desperate. She wants something to happen. She needs to be healed. And go back to verse 20. I'll read it again. And a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. She just just reaches out and, and touches the fringe. And here's what she's thinking. For she was saying to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will get well. Literally, I will be saved. Now, you and I reading that with full New Testament eyes understand when she says, I will be saved, she's thinking about physical salvation, but we recognize who Christ is and what his purpose is and that it's faith that saves, it's faith that changes. So, so Matthew, as he's writing this, is, is reminding us of two different things, that Jesus does bring healing and he brings it through faith, but he ultimately brings salvation through faith. She just trusts, she reaches out, she says, I will be saved. Mark, once again, gives us more detail. In Mark chapter 5, verses 30 through 33, the Bible says this. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? Because there's all kind of people around them. And he looked around to see the woman who had done this, but the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. So Mark gives us that little detail in there that Jesus is traveling with his guys. They're going to Jairus' house. Remember, that's why, they're, that's why the whole crowd's there. That's why they're following him. He's going to, to bring this little girl back to life, and he, he perceives, he feels the power for healing coming out of him. And he turns around, he says, well, who did that? Now, the big question is, did he stop and say who did it so that they could then have the conversation? Or, and, and he knew all along because he is God, he did it. Or is it one of these instances, which Jesus seems to do a couple times, where he, as God, decides to not know something? For instance, he'll ask, where, where is he buried, you know, about Lazarus? And it seems to be a legitimate question. It's one of those things people write books about, and it's interesting to talk about. Whatever the circumstance is, they stop. They're on the way. I wonder what Jairus is thinking about this because he, he needs to get Jesus to his house. And they're stopping, and this woman who is unclean, this woman who is basically an outcast, has come, and Jesus stops, and he has this conversation with her. And Mark tells us that she, tells, she, she explains everything. Matthew gives us the other end of the conversation. He gives us what Jesus said. Look at verse 22. But Jesus turning and seeing her said, and I love this, he says, daughter. Remember, he's on the way to Jairus' house. He's on the way to heal Jairus' daughter. But who is this? This is God the Son. This is God himself. We are children of God. He calls her, he says, daughter, take courage. It's the exact same thing he said earlier in the chapter when they, when they lowered the paralytic through the roof and put him right in front of Jesus. So what he, says, he says, take courage. So he's encouraging her. Your faith has made you well. Once again, literally, your faith has saved you. And notice what happens. And at once, the woman was made well. Immediately. Immediately, she's healed. This just happens along the way. He's still not to where he's supposed to go. She has such faith, though. She says, if I can just reach out and touch his garment, probably the tassels that would have been commanded in the Old Testament to have on the end of his garment, if I can just just touch that, I'll be healed. And that's exactly what what happened do you and I have that kind of faith do we have that kind of trust do we just believe God's going to do something do we just live knowing that if we reach out to him that he is God and he's capable and wants to do things for us it's a very convicting question I think for me anyway well we're still traveling so go back to verse 23 when Jesus came into the official's house so they get to Jairus's house and saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder. Now, that's a weird sentence if you don't quite know what's happening here. Here's what would happen. Now, we have our own funeral. Every, every culture has its own way to do funerals. Ours has changed, actually. This is interesting. I, I, in November, I will have been a pastor for, I told you all doing math while I'm up here is dangerous, so I did this earlier. Uh, I'll have been a pastor for 17 years in November. Funeral culture has changed just in the decade and a half that I've been a pastor. 
it was always standard, probably the first seven or eight years that I was pastoring, that you always had a visitation on a different day than the funeral. That is no longer the case. Now, some of it was pandemic-driven, but this actually was happening before, where it's not unusual now for us to have the visitation and the funeral and all that stuff on the same day. It's just, for some reason, that has changed. I don't know why. So it, that's kind of our, how we do funerals. That's our culture. Their culture was you had to hire two flute players and at least one wailing woman. And so you can imagine walking into this house, you've got two people on flutes, and you've got a woman just wailing at the top of her lungs. I mean, that's what they, because it was an outward expression of mourning, right? I mean, this is just, that's how they did it. And so this is what Jesus walks into. And so it would have been noisy. It would, there would have been disorder. There would have been all kinds of stuff going on. And people would have been there, and the flute players are doing their thing, and, and the ladies yelling, and it's just, it's just not good. So verse 24, he takes care of that. He said, leave. So he tells them all to leave. In other words, y'all get out. For the girl has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. Now, one of the reasons that, I, that he said she had not died but was asleep, but we know from what the dad has said and from the other Gospels, she was actually dead. We're going to see in a minute that this miracle is for a very small group of people. And one of the things very early in Jesus' ministry was that he would tell people, now look, don't, don't go out and tell everybody what's just happened. Because early in his ministry, things needed to be built up. People would have gotten way ahead of him. They'd have wanted to try to make him, you know, the Messiah and have some kind of, you know, military coup or whatever. This was a, a slow buildup to Jerusalem. This is a slow buildup to the cross. And so this miracle is about to happen for a small group of people. So I think one of the reasons he tells that group that she's just asleep, which is also a way to say she's dead, they would use the same words. You know, this, this will help with this thing not going crazy as far as spreading, although it actually, that's not actually what ends up happening. The word does spread. But he says, all right, y'all, she's asleep. They start laughing at him. Verse 25, he said, it says, but when the crowd had been sent out. So they finally do. They finally leave. Now, Luke tells us something here. Luke tells us who goes into the room. In Luke 8, 51, Luke, when he tells the story, says, When he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except Peter, James, Peter, John, and James, and the girl's father and mother. So that's who goes in the room. Jesus, Peter, James, and John, and mom and dad. That's it. Everybody else, the wailing woman, the flute players, everybody else, they're gone. Peter, James, and John are part of that group. Jesus would have the, you know, he had the, the 70. He had the 12 in the 70 and then he had the three in the 12 and these are those three that often he would pull aside by themselves these are going to be the early leaders of the church you know when when he finally when he ascends into heaven so he spent special time with these guys he pulls them in and he pulls in the parents and so now they're going to go in and he's going to heal this girl verse 25 again but when the crowd had been sent out he entered and took her by the hand and the girl got up Mark gives us more detail here. Mark in chapter 5, verses 41 through 43, gives us what Jesus said. It says, Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, so we know how old she was. Immediately they were completely astounded. Well, of course they were. She, she was dead, and now she's, she's alive. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And then I love this. And he said that something should be given her to eat. Well, she, you know, she, she needed sustenance. It's just a very caring thing that, that God does there. He's like, y'all need to get this girl some food. She's, she's been out of it. She's healed. And then back in Matthew, it says, this news spread throughout all the land. Jairus just showed up at the beginning of the paragraph and says, my daughter has died, and I know if you come, she'll live. He doesn't express any doubt. He's very matter-of-fact about it. He just simply has faith. And while they're on the way, this lady, we don't know her name, but the Holy Spirit preserved her story, is healed because of her faith. So let's go back to the question we asked at the beginning. How's your faith? 
Do you and I exhibit the kind of faith that we see in this synagogue official, Jairus, and in, that we see in this, this woman with the hemorrhage? Do we, do we live with an understanding that, that God is always going to be doing something that, that is in accordance with his nature and who he is, and we just trust him and know and live with that kind of faith? Honestly, very few of us do. I know I don't. I struggle with this thing because we all think we can figure stuff out on our own. When do, we, when do we finally make prayer requests in Sunday school or on Wednesday night? Usually when we, when we can't do the thing that we think we need to do. We'll raise our hand and say, I have a prayer request. And if it's a personal thing, it'll be you know, health-related or job-related or finances or whatever it is. And we typically don't voice those things until we've come to the realization that we can't actually take care of it ourselves. And that... Whenever we do voice them, that's a good thing. We need to be there for one another and pray for one another. But often, guys, we think the way we function is that faith is the last resort. Not the first assumption, but the last resort. Because we just think, well, I'll take care of this myself. I, I, know, I know what to do here. I know how to handle this. But that is what we see here is people that just simply believe God and trust him to do something. Faith is, is everything in our walk with him. Two things I want you to think about with faith this morning. First of all, and, and this is step one, faith saves us. That's step one. You have to have saving faith. To live with the kind of faith that we see in Jairus and, and the woman with the hemorrhage, to be able to live with this kind of faith and to trust Jesus, you have to know him. You have to have what's called saving faith. You have to have that personal relationship with him. Let me give you some verses. Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You have to hear the word of God and place your faith in Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Acts 20, 21, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. How does a person become a Christian. You hear the gospel. You hear that Jesus died for your sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, and that he rose on the third day according to the scripture. And that if you will repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. That's how a person is saved. They call on the name of the Lord. The, the Bible says, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And it is a trusting, faithful act to call on God. Because we have to come to the point to recognize hell is real, eternity is real, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is real, that salvation is real, and that we can't save ourselves. When all that clicks in, we've got to trust what the Word of God says. We have to place our faith in Him. One of the best examples, I remember in, uh, in Dr. Gray's evangelism classes at Mid-America, one of the examples he would give was when you sat in your pew today, most likely you didn't question it. You just sat down. You placed your faith in that pew for this hour. That's what we do when we, when we come to faith in Christ. We rest in Him. We, we, we trust Him completely. We surrender to him and to have the kind of faith that we see with these two individuals we have to first call on the name of the lord and be saved and have have saving faith but then once we do that here's the great thing that same faith sustains us so not only guys does faith save us but faith sustains us it keeps us going let me give you some verses again some of these you know very well galatians 2 20 i've been crucified with christ it's no, no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Hebrews 1.11, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You and I can't see Jesus. He's at the right hand of the Father. We can't see the Father. Jesus said nobody can see him. We can't see the Holy Spirit. He's spirit. There is a faith element to this thing. We have to trust the word of God and trust what it says is true. And after we place our faith in him, he doesn't change and we don't change. That same faith helps us to grow in our relationship. Conviction of things not seen. 
James 1, 2, and 3, James, the half-brother of Jesus, would write, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. The world's going to throw things at us so that our faith grows. And then 1 John 5, 4, one of our hymns that we sing comes from this verse. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. We sing that song, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Do you and I trust him completely with every single aspect of our life? If you're here today and you have saving faith, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. If, if you died right now, you'd be in the presence of God. You know for sure, like the, I remember as a kid, Don Wilton would preach at our church. You know that 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 Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Let me ask you, are you living a life of faith? Do you trust him with every part of your life? Or are there some areas where we're like, I got this. I know what to do with my money. I know what to do with the relationships in my life. I know what to do with, with, with work. And I know what to do with business. I know what to do. And, and we've got all that. And then if something really bad happens, then we'll start to exercise faith. Now, none of us actually think that. None of us, on purpose, if we know the Lord, make the decision to live like that. We just tend to fall into that pattern, unfortunately. So let me ask you, do you trust him in everything? Everything. The decisions you make in your marriage, in your family, at work, with your finances, with your health. Do we actually trust? trust him because if he saved you and you're his you are his child and he is a loving heavenly father who who wants to to see you grow who wants to see you mature in your faith and wants to take care of you God is not Zeus with a lightning bolt waiting for you to mess up he is a loving heavenly father who wants us to come to him and lean on him and just surrender to him completely are you doing that as a believer or, or, have you never exercised saving faith? Maybe one of the reasons you struggle to trust God is because you don't trust God. Have you repented of your sins and placed your faith in Christ? Is he your Lord and Savior? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you given it all up? Have you come to the point where you recognize you cannot do anything about your own eternity? but that God provided eternity through Christ. Have you surrendered to him? If you haven't, you need to exercise saving faith today, and then you can begin to live a life of faith like Jairus, like the woman with the hemorrhage, like the men and women in this room who, who trust Jesus with every part of their life. Have you done that? Those of you who are watching at home, maybe you're watching on Facebook right now or watching on, on YouTube later, if you're a believer, the challenge to you is, does your life demonstrate that you believe God? If you have an area in your life that you haven't surrendered to him, trust him with it. Or have you surrendered your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you want to talk about these kinds of things, send me an email. John, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org. Send us a Facebook message uh, to, to the church as well. The only people that will see it are the administrators, and uh, that's just the staff, and, and we can respond to any questions you have. But if you know him, live a life that shows that you know him and trust him. And if you don't know him, repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus. In just a minute, a second, we're going to log off uh, for those on the live stream and let me say, a few people have asked about why we do this, uh, we, why we don't stay on through the invitation. One of the things I want to make sure of is that anyone here in the room doesn't feel a little bit nervous about responding and still being on camera and all of that. So that's why we shut it down before we come to the, the actual come forward time. But for those of you at home, just like for everybody else in the room, the invitation never actually ends. Uh, this is something, God doesn't go anywhere. So trust him at all times with everything that you have. Thank you guys uh, for being with us today. We're going we're to log off for this for now.